Welcome to CLCC. We pray that this message draws you towards Jesus and strengthens your relationship with him. We believe that we are meant to do life in the community. If you live in the Fraser Valley area, we would love to get you connected into the family. Find everything you need at clcc.ca. Enjoy the message. This morning, we're concluding our series called Followers. This has been a discussion of what it looks like to live as the disciple of Jesus. We've talked about how followers are called, how they must count the cost. They go, they rest in God's presence, and they persevere. Today, we're looking at the fact that Jesus' followers are transformed. When I was young, someone came up with the idea of a creature that changed from one thing to another. Okay, the idea probably wasn't new, but the packaging and marketing was. You may have heard of them transformers. These creatures would change from one thing like a car into a robot or something like that. There were toys and then movies based on them and for kids they were kind of fun and interesting because the ability to change from one thing to another is pretty amazing. For most people, even adults, the idea that we could change when needed does sound exciting. There are times when being someone or something different than you currently are would be pretty helpful. Maybe you want to be stronger or smarter or an extrovert or a better parent. If you could do that without having to go through any hard work, that sounds pretty good. We like the idea of a quick, tr easy transformation, don't we? Unfortunately, the reality is that as much as we may want to, we don't have the ability to transform in these extreme ways. And yet, we all grow and develop. Children become adults through some serious transformation. We all learn to walk and talk and get new teeth. This is cool stuff. As we get older, we don't always enjoy some of the changes we encounter, aches and pains for no reason, gray hair, no hair, losing our teeth, etc. Not many of us love the aging process, but this is all part of the transformation that happens in life. And it's expected, at least physically. Mentally or emotionally, we also mature, or we're supposed to. Maybe we're still hoping for that. I guess some of us never really grow up. It's hard to be an adult, isn't it? But this morning, we are not talking about transformers or our personal development. We are considering how we, as disciples of Jesus, are to grow and change. I think we know this is supposed to happen, but it doesn't seem to happen as naturally as our physical development, does it? If you've never noticed or thought much about this concept, let me suggest a few scriptures that talk about this. In John 3, verse 3, it says, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Galatians 2, 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. Ephesians 4.24 says we are to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Romans 6.2 says we are those who have died to sin. There's a lot of pretty amazing descriptions of transformation that should be happening in our lives as we get to know Jesus. And when you first become a follower of Christ, this may have been very obvious. Some of you had some powerful and dramatic conversions. Maybe your language or your attitudes and behavior all changed very quickly. Others of you might have experienced more gradual change, and, and that's okay. Transformation happens differently in different people. As long as it's happening, that's what's important. The trouble is, spiritual transformation doesn't seem to be automatic. There's a few scriptures that suggest not everyone grows up spiritually. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2, we read, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit. But as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not re yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. Hebrews 5.12 echoes the same thought. It says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Apparently, spiritual transformation isn't guaranteed. And you may know people who have been taught about Jesus and even seen the work of God uh, happening around them, and yet they still struggle to live faithful, mature Christian lives. There are those who have never gone any deeper in their spiritual understanding and application than simply salvation. But the goal is transformation. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to examine your current level of spiritual maturity and make the necessary adjustments to ensure that growth is happening in your life. 
To help us, ex- we are going to examine a passage of Scripture that gives us a very concise picture of how this transformation might happen. Towards the end of Luke's gospel, we have a story of two individuals who go from not even recognizing who Jesus is to seeing him clearly and telling others about him. That sounds like significant spiritual transformation, doesn't it? As we examine this passage of scripture, we are encouraged that transformation is possible and we are challenged that as, as to what our goal, our role in the process is. For me, this is exciting because I know that I need spiritual transformation in my life. And I hope you do as well. Our text today is Luke 24. It's a fairly long passage of scripture, so I'm, I'm going to summarize the first part of the story and then we will read a few verses towards the end of the passage. In Luke 24, 24, the first 12 verses, uh, we find Jesus' resurrection described. And then starting in verse 13, he tells us of two individuals who meet up with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Now, Emmaus was a village about seven miles or 11 kilometers from Jerusalem, which is a pretty decent walk. After being in Jerusalem for the Passover and witnessing the incredible events of Jesus' crucifixion, there are two individuals that are heading home on this road. One is named Cleopas and the other is unnamed. Some have suggested it may have been Luke himself who's writing this. Others suggested it may have been Cleopas' wife. We don't know, but we know there was two of them. Luke says that this is the same day, meaning this was the resurrection day. Now, you'd think this would be a happy day, but it would appear they did not know about that part of the story. They didn't know Jesus was risen from the dead as their faces are downcast. As they're going, Jesus meets up with them and travels with him, but they don't recognize him. Now, the idea of of traveling with a stranger wasn't unusual. Connecting with others along the road would have been pretty normal. And failing to recognize Jesus after the resurrection seems a little bit normal, too. John records several instances where people didn't recognize the risen Lord. So when Jesus joins these individuals, they're talking about the events they had heard about or witnessed in Jerusalem. And Jesus asks them what they're talking about. And Cleopas, he's a little stunned and that Jesus didn't seem to know about what had happened. Was he the only one in Jerusalem who didn't know about this? Obviously, news of Jesus' crucifixion was apparently some pretty big news and something to talk about. These individuals tell Jesus what had happened, and then Jesus explains to them how the scriptures point to him, the Messiah. But they still don't know who he is. As they near Emmaus, Jesus indicates he's going further, but they urged him to stay. And again, this was not unusual. Hospitality in that culture was a big deal. Fellow Jews would willingly offer another Jew a meal or a place to stay. At this point, they still have no idea who Jesus is. And let's read what happened starting in verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So we went in to stay with him. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is a very interesting passage. Uh, One author describes this as a life-changing walk, and I love that idea. It's a great picture of the transformation that is happening in the lives of the disciples and should be happening or has happened in our own. This morning, I want to make some observations from this story in order to see if we can make a connection to our own journey of spiritual transformation. First of all, let's notice that Jesus came looking for them. As we look at this story, we see that Jesus joins the disciples. And I don't think this was an accident. Jesus is the one taking the the initiative. He came to them. And I think this is a great reminder that Jesus has come looking for you and for me. That's the story of salvation. God sent Jesus to us. We didn't initiate our salvation. We didn't even know we needed a Savior. And transformation happens here because they responded to Jesus when he came looking for them, not because of anything they did. And it's great he came because they needed him. Secondly, I would say they were walking in the dark. Okay, it's not that it was literally dark, but I think this image works here because the two on the road didn't recognize Jesus. And symbolically, our spiritual reality is darkness when we don't know Jesus. Now, I don't know how it fully works that they didn't recognize him. 
Um, did he look different? Was his resurrected body so different than before that they couldn't tell it was him? It, it seems that it could have been possible that he looked different physically. We read at the end of this story that he disappears, kind of like a magic act almost. Or was it they were so distracted by all that was going on? I mean, that happens. We get so focused on one thing that we miss what God may be up to or even that God is present with us. It, it, it could have happened. But the text seems to suggest that their eyes were blinded. Jesus, the way and the truth is right in front of them and they don't recognize him. The word used here suggests that their eyes were prevented from seeing him. That sounds like spiritual blindness. And spiritual blindness makes sense and that certainly parallels many people's experiences today. Think of how many people know about Jesus but don't know him. Jesus has come as the savior of the world and many people know something about his story, perhaps Christmas or Easter, or they at very least know his name as a swear word, but they have no clue who he is or that he is right in front of them. Maybe that was your story. You were unable to see the truth of who Jesus was and how he wanted to connect with you even when you were presented with the truth. And that's what happens here. Jesus explains who he is. He shows him in the scripture all about himself, but they still don't recognize him. They don't get it. I mean, there's something strange going on, isn't there? I mean, Jesus is talking about the scriptures. He's teaching them and showing them how he, the Messiah, has been revealed in the scriptures, and they don't make the connection. We often try to boil our faith down to facts and logic, which are important. But don't forget, there's a spiritual dimension to our faith, which means until our eyes are open, we don't get it. We don't see Jesus. We don't understand. And that's a tough spot to be in. But there's hope. What we see here is that the desire to know more about Jesus and be with him was stirring in their hearts. They were curious. Something was growing within them and they didn't fight it. They didn't ignore it. They let their curiosity get the better of them. Now there's a saying, curiosity killed the cat. And curiosity can get us in trouble, especially in an age where there's so much information available to us. So we do need to be careful. But when the Holy Spirit starts stirring something within us, we need to respond and let that lead us to Jesus. Anyone who has walked this spiritual journey of discovery knows that at some point something stirs within you. You want to know more. You want to be with Jesus. You, you want to go to church. You want to read his word. That is a spiritual hunger. And let that rise up within us. Here are the two on the road. They want Jesus to stay with them, which indicates to me a pretty high level of curiosity. And now we could say that this was just polite hospitality, but it was more than that. The words used in our text are they urged him strongly. And the Greek word behind that actually means to force or to compel or to persuade. And that means this is not just a polite ask or a slight suggestion. The image is almost like they forced him. I like to think of it that, like they grabbed him and hung on to him for dear life. You're not leaving. You're staying with us. That, that's how badly they wanted to be with him. Have you ever wanted something that badly in your life? Maybe as a child, you hung on to your parents' leg saying, don't go, stay with me. And if you're still doing that as an adult, that might need to change. But have you ever wanted Jesus that badly? Do you want to be with him so badly it feels like you're forcing him to stay? When you start to get curious, when something is stirring inside of you, it, it happens. Unfortunately, as we mature, we become more refined in our faith. And we may lose that urgency. We may just fit Jesus in when it is convenient and in a refined kind of manner. But that isn't the picture we see here. They wanted to be with Jesus. When Lynette and I were dating, we didn't live in the same town. Uh, she was in the Lower Mainland, and I was living in Campbell River on Vancouver Island. And so we talked on the phone a lot. But this is when phone calls cost money, a, a lot of money for long distance. So we would call late at night. It was cheaper then but we loved hearing each other's voices. We just wanted to be together in some way, and it was beautiful. It was sappy, I know, but we wanted to be together. Now that we've been married for 30 years, or almost 30 years, we, we want our space. No, actually, we still love spending time together, and generally, we get along. We like it. Now, whether you've been a Christian for a few months or many years, I hope you want to spend time with Jesus. It may look or feel a little different if you've been a Christ follower for many years, but there should still be a longing to be with Jesus. If not, maybe we need to remember who is walking with us. You have the Savior of the world wanting to be with you. Do you long for his presence to be with him? I hope so. Now, in our story, this longing happened even before they realized who Jesus was. Remember what happens next. Jesus actually stays with them. And this is a beautiful part of the salvation story. Um, when you call on Jesus, he stays. 
And it's one of the most amazing promises of scripture that God is with us. Listen to a, a few of the scriptures. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Never will I leave you nor forsake you. Psalm 139, 7 says, Where can I go to escape your presence? Matthew 28, 20 says, I will be with you always. There's a term that describes God, omnipresent. And it means that God is always with us. He's, he's everywhere. It's a beautiful concept, which we kind of understand. We know he's a good shepherd who stays with us even when we go through dark valleys. And we, we know this, but sometimes we lose sight of the personal nature of God's presence that he is with us today, right now. In our text, we see that Jesus stays with these two individuals. And in a very personal and special moment, they recognize him. As Jesus breaks bread with them, their eyes are open. As they share a meal together, this is the moment they recognize him. To me, this sounds like a pretty powerful spiritual moment. They finally get it. They see Jesus as he is. They know he is their savior, and it's beautiful. But let's think about what happened here to see if there's anything we can learn that relates to our own spiritual journey. Notice that Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. The language is very similar to the language of communion, isn't it? This is the language Jesus used at the Last Supper and is also similar to that uh, used by Luke and Matthew to describe how Jesus fed the 5,000. So depending on who these individuals were in this story and what their connection to Jesus was, this situation might have seemed a little bit familiar to them and reminded them of Jesus. But I think it's more than that. I think the fact that Jesus takes the initiative in serving them is very significant. It might sound normal to us because we know who Jesus is. But remember, he is a guest in their home. They should have been taking the food and blessing it and handing it to him. For someone looking in on this situation, it might have seemed a little bit strange. But Jesus knows who he is, and he takes on the role of the giver, and they submit to it. It is the right way things should be done when Jesus is in the room. For us, this is important. This is the way of God's kingdom. When we start with a posture of surrender, submission, and we accept the life-giving nourishment from Jesus, our eyes are open. This is a great reason to celebrate communion. We're reminded of his life-giving power. We're reminded of his presence as the risen Savior with us at this very moment. And as we celebrate communion, we pray that our eyes will be open again to the power and presence of God at work within us and all around us. In retrospect, these disciples knew something was going on. We read that they felt their hearts were burning within them. Something deep inside was stirring as they hung out with Jesus. This was a deeply spiritual moment. Jesus teaching them from the scriptures combined with their eyes being opened. I mean, this is wonderful. Has it happened to you? Has your heart connected on a deep spiritual level with your Savior? Have your eyes been opened to the truth of who he is? If you are a follower of Jesus, I hope so. When your eyes are opened, something amazing happens. Transformation. Things changed. Luke tells us that after their eyes were opened, they got up at once and went back to Jerusalem. Now, remember, they'd just gotten home, and it was a decent journey, probably three hours long or so. And so to turn around and head back was a little inconvenient, but they had to tell the disciples. What started as a depressing walk home turned into a victory celebration. When they got to Jerusalem, they found the 11 and told them what had happened. They knew Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, clearly these two were connected with Jesus and the disciples. They should have recognized him, but they didn't. And yet once their eyes were open, things changed. They couldn't keep it quiet. And that is the power of an encounter with Jesus, transformation. Within an afternoon, a three-hour walk, they go from downcast and distraught regarding the death of their Savior to encouraging others about his resurrection. Their eyes were open. They were forever changed. Now, I get this was a fast encounter. But as I said, this gives us a picture of what happens when we encounter our, our Savior. It doesn't always happen within three hours or over a meal. For some, this may take months or years, but when our eyes are opened, it's amazing. Now, there's two areas of application I want to highlight. One is for us personally or corporately as a church, and one is for those we are praying for to discover God's goodness. First, our personal journey of transformation. I think we, need to each, we each need to consider where we're at on our journey of transformation. My hope and prayer is that we have all encountered Jesus in such a way that we have had our spiritual eyes open, that we've come to know him as our Savior. But if you have not, this is a great day to surrender to him and discover the life he has for you. Now, my guess is that many of you have had that experience with Jesus. Some of you are longtime believers, and you may wonder, what's the application for me? Well, here's a challenge. Even if you are a long-term believer, 
you may need a fresh encounter with Jesus. You may need to surrender to him again and let him open your eyes to discover all he has for you. In our story this morning, these individuals were not what we would call unbelievers. They knew the disciples. They knew Jesus. They had no doubt seen miracles and heard the teachings of Jesus. We know that because our text starts by saying two of them, referencing disciples. Further, it says they recognized Jesus. They had a previous connection with him. And then they had great hopes for what Jesus would do. And so when he was crucified, they didn't know what was happening. And this presents us with, if we're long-time believers, with a challenge. Will we continue to live with humility and surrender to God, especially if we've lost hope in what God can do? Or if we are discouraged by what we see around us? That was the state of those on the road to Emmaus. Their world had come crashing down. But as they spent time with Jesus and surrendered to him, their eyes were open. They saw new possibilities. In James 4, 6, it says that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And this text illustrates that. When the disciples let Jesus lead, even when it wasn't normal, their eyes were opened. For us, will we let Jesus be in control, in charge, on our turf, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our relationships, in our recreation, or with our money, the places we normally want control, we need to let Jesus be in control. Will we surrender to his ways, his plans, his lordship, personally and corporately as a church? Together, we need to let Jesus lead us and guide us. And if we can do this, we discover that he continues to change us, our attitudes, our perspectives, and we interact with one another in a much more godly way. God wants to change us, and he will if we let him be in charge. The second area of application here is that this account gives us a picture of the journey our friends or loved ones may be on if they have not yet come to faith. Maybe you've been telling them about Jesus, but they aren't getting it. Just wait. Let the Holy Spirit stir some spiritual curiosity in them. Maybe they are curious and interested, but their eyes just are not open. Well, let the Holy Spirit do his work and participate with the Holy Spirit. And we do that by representing Jesus well. When they look at us, do they see Jesus? Remember, actions speak louder than words. When things are stirring in their hearts, let's encourage them to surrender to him in greater ways. This morning, I want you to know that transformation is the goal. God wants that for you, he, and, and we need it. It should be happening, or maybe it has happened. Or perhaps you're feeling a little bit stuck. And if you are feeling like nothing is happening or nothing ever will change in your spiritual life, remember that with God, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with him. That's the core of the gospel. The dead can rise. The broken can be restored. The impossible is made possible through Jesus. In your life, do you need this reminder that change and transformation is possible? Maybe you've lost hope. Maybe you've given up. If that is you, remember that Jesus is not only able to change your circumstances, he can change you. Your deepest and strongest and seemingly unbreakable habits and behaviors, God is able to bring transformation to you. And if God can change and transform you, God can change and transform those you're praying for. I want you to leave here today knowing that change and transformation is possible in your life and in the lives of others. Let's pray that happens. Let's make sure that happens in us, but let's pray for that in others. Let's, let's surrender, let's give up, let's let him be in charge and let him lead. Amazing things happen and amazing things are possible when we walk in surrender to him. So are, are you experiencing the transforming power and presence of God? Are you praying for that in the lives of those around you? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is spirit. Transformation is the goal, and it's possible with Jesus. Let me pray for you as we conclude today. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful that you walk with us, and uh, I pray that each of us would have our eyes open to see you at work in our lives and how you're leading us and guiding us. I pray that we would experience the transformation that you desire for our lives. And I pray that you'd give us hope and courage to pray and to act in ways that encourage those around us to experience the life-changing power of God in their lives as well. May your blessing be in each one today. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us. If you are looking to get connected, our Abbotsford campus has two Sunday morning gatherings at 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. We would love to see you at one of our in-person gatherings.
If you would like to give financially, you can always support us online at clcc.ca slash give. See you next time.